Alléluia. Alléluia. Amen. Welcome in the house of the Lord, shall we pray. Father, we bless your name, Lord God. We thank you for your goodness and your blessings. We thank you for your guidance and for your help. We thank you for your direction. Thank you for the things that you do in our midst, in us, inside of us. And thank you for the things that you do through us and for us. We bless you. We ask that you speak unto us your word and your wisdom in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Alleluia. Amen. So we're going to go today in our word, which is a... Alleluia. Gonna in our word today is uh, the second part of what we did uh, two Sundays ago. Amen. And the word is about simply you have been delivered to serve divine purpose. You have been delivered to serve divine purpose. And two Sundays ago, we spoke about what is divine purpose. Who remember? Mm -hmm. What is divine purpose? Okay, no, but two Sundays ago, we have uh, explained from the Word of God what the Word of God actually tells us our divine purpose, which is a primary one. Who remembers that? Hallelujah. To spread the gospel. Hallelujah. Because he has first delivered us, saved us, set us free, so we become witness, amen, unto others. That's the first purpose. That's the divine purpose. Hallelujah. Now, in that divine purpose, you have what we call level of vision or level of missions. For instance, you can be in a divine purpose if you are a, uh, a head of state. Your, the way you will serve will be through the law that you pass. Are you what I'm saying? If you are a, uh, a police officer, the way you serve will be on how you operate and you deal with people on a daily basis. So whatever divine purpose is the first thing is to be a witness. Um, I, I believe Friday we, are, we were watching a uh, Christian movie and uh, uh, from, from actual elements of life, there was a guy who was a uh, firefighter. No, no, he was a EMS. EMT, EMT, not EMS. And then he believed Christ. He loved Christ. And he went to uh, rescue somebody. And the person was dying. He was an atheist. And that person was dying. And that person said, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid. I'm, I'm scared. Well, you know, when you have life and you breathe, sometimes you have the impression that you have everything in your control. But the day of your death, that's, that's that day you will feel, hallelujah, and the most uh, strongest atheists, they have always come around in the day of their sickness. Anyway, so that guy, he starts screaming, I mean crying, saying that he is afraid. He does not know what to do. And what would happen with, with him? What would be after life? No, his whole life he did not believe that there was anything after life. Now he is about to die. Now he's asking questions, what would happen to him after he's died? So the guy right there shared with him the Lord and gave him the opportunity to give his life to Christ, just like the thief on the cross. And the woman, the wife, came. When she saw it, she was so angry, she took the man to court. And she said that uh, instead of her helping the husband to recover, she ra he rather went to preach Jesus. So she was angry. She did everything to take him down. So the guy boss called him and he said, you know, uh, we understand you are Christian, but you don't have to shove your faith into people's life. He said, I didn't do that. I did first my duty as a rescuer, and I did apply all the different things. And then at the last minute, there was nothing more to do. And as we're waiting for the ambulance to come or whatever, something, uh, the, the, the guy was just asking questions that I answered. And the guy said, well, yeah, yeah, but the, the boss said, yes, but, you know, just go ahead and then write a beautiful letter of, her, of her apologies to explain how you did wrong and you will never do it again. So the guy said, but if I do it, what about the next person I will ever meet 
Yeah. You see, he was able to stand not because he wanted to disobey or confront or rebel against the authority, but because he wanted to be faithful to God. There is a very big difference between rebelling against the authority and remaining faithful to God. A Christian who rebels against the authority is a witch. He doesn't come from God. Because rebellion is not the spirit of God. Hallelujah. But a Christian who is faithful to God, eventually he will have to stand on the things of God. Therefore, the word of God will be against the uncleanness of the authority. That's what I'm saying. So in your heart, in your spirit, is not, oh, I'm going to not do this. No, no, no. In your heart is rather, I'm going to stay with the Lord. I'm going to stand with the Lord. So the man decided to stand with the Lord against all hopes. Eventually, he went through trouble. Amen? And when he went through trouble, they took him to court. And the lawyer of that woman came and she said, all you have to do is just to apologize and say you will never do it again. And the man says, no, I cannot do that. And then the lady says, but you don't understand that the, the state and then the union and then the insurance and all those, they want to make out of you an example. You don't understand that they don't care about your faith. They just don't want to hear your faith no more. So the clear message is they don't want to hear Jesus no more. But while they don't want to hear Jesus, they allow people who curse in the name of Jesus. That same name that they don't want to hear, but if you use the name in a mockery, then they're fine. If you use the name for salvation, then they have a problem. So it lets you know it's not about you, it's a spiritual matter. So the man decided to stand on his faith, and eventually he lost everything at the court in the battle. So they were going out, and a crash happened on the, on the bridge. And when the crash happened, the lawyer who was, who was ruining his life was in a car that was taking fire. And the man happened to drive and to be there. Now, what would you do? <laughs> Hallelujah. So, first, because he's an EMT, and then he's a Christian, Amen. Love your enemies. Pray for those who. You know, many of the Christians that I know, they will be like, yeah, you should not touch the anointed. That should burn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they will be singing and dancing. No. So he went and then took her out from the fire and rescued her. And then after she came and she asked him, but why did you help me? Well, because I, I, I'm called for that. So by this act, she turned around and she understood that God was true and she started herself giving her life to Christ. Hallelujah. So your trouble and your problem oftentimes is a pathway that God will use to help your neighbor. I read again. Your trouble and your problems is oftentimes a pathway that God will use to help your neighbor. You may be in a difficult situation and thinking, why is that happening to me? But if you look at the divine purpose, you will start understanding that God is able to turn everything around. And because he's able to turn everything around, there is not such a thing that is too complicated for God to achieve and to perform. But it ought to be in your heart a decision of saying, one, my Lord liveth, I shall live. Two, God is with me, who shall be against me? Put it this way. What are the most awful things that can happen to somebody in this world? Is death. But yet, God said, Christ said, that he has defeated death. In another word, what makes somebody afraid of dying is not because he's going to lose his shoe. It's because he does not know if he's going to live after death. Put it this way. If you know that uh, you have a better things in another country, 
and you live in this country, and they say all your belonging are left in that other country, and then if you go in that other country, you're gonna become a prince or you're gonna become a rich man, and you are in this country and you broke. Well, if they say okay, if this country say we're gonna deport you in that other country where you will be rich, you will be say hallelujah, amen. Amen. And that we get you into the plane for free and then you will go there and when you arrive there, you have all your possession. So when you know that where you're going is a promise of certainty, you're not afraid to go there. That's what the Bible says that we may know that we have eternal life. If you don't know that you have eternal life, it is eventual that you will have fear in your spirit. So the purpose of God is for us first to be delivered, second to be set free in order to serve his divine purpose. And he, again, his divine purpose is to speak of what Christ has done through our actions, through our testimonies, through our lives, through our conversations. Hallelujah. So you are set free, you are delivered for divine purpose. And if you are delivered for divine purpose, but you do not fulfill the divine purpose and you are rather fulfilling your own purpose, you will conflict yourself continually and then your soul and your heart, your soul and your mind will always be burdened. So divine purpose is what gives you the peace that you need. Let me explain something to you. When God created us, the Bible says he put his spirit in us. This is very important because what it means is that whatever you are, whatever you do, God is there because he put his spirit in you. Hallelujah. David says, I don't know where I could run away from you. If I go even to hell, you will find me there. <laughs> Hallelujah. If I go in the Sheol, you will find me there. There is not a place where I could run away from you, so you won't find me there. So people who oftentimes say, I'm atheist, I don't believe in God. All they're saying is that because God exists and he is, I don't want him. They're not saying that he does not exist or he is not. Uh, hallelujah. Because the spirit of God that is inside of them testify against them that God is. That's why they are angry. Hallelujah. A pagan? No. The Bible says that um, some of them, they were worshiping a God they did not know. The reason is Christ has come to, 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 to show us the path so that uh, we can enter into that presence without too much complication. Because remember in those days, you have to do a lot of uh, dance. <laughs> <laughs> meaning sacrifices, you have to kill the bull, you have to do this, you have to kill this in order to be able to, you not even enter the holies of the holies, not even the, um, uh, after the outer court, uh, the inner court. So you come to the temple, you have the outer court, you have the inner court, you have the holies of the holies, and you arrive for you even to enter into the outer court is, is problem. Because you have to be uh, not only part of the of the of the of the covenant, a stranger could not just come into the temple. Stranger will come, and they will be out of the outer court. And then you will come. You will be in the outer court. How are you gonna do now to go in the in, inner court? That's another problem. And then in the holies of the holies, even if you were quote unquote. The most holiest of the of the land, you cannot go there either. Because in the holy of the holies, there was only one time. Ah, when? A year. Can you imagine? So put it this way. Outer court is a problem to get there. Inner court is not even possible. And then holy of the holies, if it's even possible, you have to wait one time a year. And here's the thing: if you enter the holies of the holies, and then you were found with sin in that day. When you enter, you come, you, you come dead. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was, the Bible said that they would have to put what? A rope on the knee, uh, the ankle, 
and then they tie them out so that they, when they go in, if he has ever done something stupid, would have died there, he dies, they have to pull his body out. Because the people who knew that they, he dead, he dead them said they go inside to take him dead also the with that. I, are you imagine? Because the, the, the level, the requirement was so high that a human being could not fulfill it. That's what the beauty of the cross is. Because the beauty of the cross is that he takes on that fulfillment that you are out, that you ought to do in order to give you the ease of entering with boldness to the throne of. Hallelujah. The Bible says, let us come with what? Boldness. To the throne of, not of judgment, of grace. Uh, 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 Lord, help us. Let us come boldly, with boldness, to the throne of grace. You see, in the holy of the holies, it was the throne of judgment. It was not the throne of grace. Because when you do something right and you go there, you're dead. You know what I'm saying? You go, you arrive, and the Lord says, son, when you hear son, you know, you know you're guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. He, didn't even, he doesn't even have to ask you what have you done. Your own sin accuses you. But now that he has died on the cross, the purpose of the cross is not that we will recite that uh, we know Jesus Christ or we are saved. No. The purpose of the cross is first that we now are ser- uh, sorry, set free to serve his divine purpose. That's the first purpose. The first reason. And for us to serve his divine purpose, we need to hear what he wants us to do. But in order to hear what he wants us to do, we need to go into his presence. But to go into his presence, we don't have to go shy. We have to go Boldly, meaning with conviction that as we go, he will hear us. And as he heareth us, he will speak. And as he speak, we will also perform. So you have a boldness, a certainty that mm, if I pray, I know he will hear. If there is a man to pray, there is a God to answer. So your boldness is because he has already put down to shame the enemy of your soul. The accusers of your soul. So you are therefore capable of saying with certainty and accuracy that indeed my Savior liveth, I will live. But the beauty of the throne of grace is when you do something wrong and you enter there, you enter there to claim grace. That's why it's the throne of grace. Now, one of the grace that you want to claim quickly is anointing. Hallelujah. You want to be anointed for the task of being a disciple. You want to be anointed for the task of being a father. You want to be anointed for the task of being a mother. Because of being a father, you just don't get up like that and you're a father. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't just get up like that. See, how many parents in this world are training their children in the ways of the Lord. Tell me how many. But how many do know they are to do so? It's not because you have a desire of doing the things of God that you will do. Your desire by itself does not make you do the things of God. That's why the Bible said, the things that I know that I will do, this I don't do. And the things that I know I should not do, this I do. Why? Because our wretch body Flesh capability is all but about against the will of God. So the throne of growth, sorry, the throne of grace is where you enter to ask for the anointing. Say, Lord, anoint me. Lord, anoint me. For complicated matter, anoint me. It's in that throne of grace that you enter boldly to say, Lord God, I need your anointing to perform your good will. I need your anointing to perform your perfect will. What is the anointing? The anointing is the flow of the spirit in you that continually calls you to hear, to do, and to operate perfectly into the, way, into the, the ways of God. It gives you certainty and conviction. It gives you certainty and boldness. It gives you a courage 
It gives you the boldness that you need in order to function without shame and without fear. When the Lord Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me. Now, look at this. When he entered inside the temple, he already knew that them people over there, they will do something wrong to him. Hallelujah. But the anointing over him gave him the boldness at the right time to step into the things that he ought to do because he knew the importance of the will of God were better than the will of a man. So for you to be able to fulfill the will of God, you ought to receive the anointing. That will be the thing inside of you that will lead you into that truth that causes you to always want to do what is perfect and upright in the sight of God. If not, it will be difficult. But that anointing, you can receive it simply because you enter boldly into the throne of grace by saying, Lord, you are my father. Are you know what I'm saying? You are my father and you have not dishonored me. Are you know what I'm saying? So you literally come to claim your portion. You are my father. And for this sake, the Lord Jesus gave the prayer to the disciple when they asked, how, Lord, should we pray? He said, when you pray, thou shalt say first, our father. So you are to recognize that he is your father who has set everything in motion to deliver you, to set you free so you can fulfill his good pleasure. But in order to fulfill his good pleasure, you need the things that comes from him. And when you enter with that boldness to the throne of grace, he cannot deny you. Let me show you this picture. A pool and a cat are oftentimes contrary because I've heard that cats don't like too much water. They can, if, if they're cool, they will walk on water. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, you have a cat, you have a pool. The cat is dirty. Dust or dirt has covered him. For him to be clean, he needs to get into the water. But he doesn't like the water. How is he going to be clean? So he will start now licking himself. The problem is that he can lick so far because his tongue cannot come over here. <laughs> his tongue cannot come over there. So how many he will clean and lick himself, he will still have spot of uncleanness. Even the spot that he licked will not be that clean. But now he's supposed to get in the water. He look in the water and he start imagining already how he's going to drown. <laughs> Hallelujah. But his solution is he had to be wet. So there is two ways. Either somebody take him and just <laughs> shove him in that water. Hallelujah. He will probably be like a, and as he's like a, you know, trying to just come out of the water, that, that struggle will actually clean him better. Mm -hmm. Because he will start now making wave of water that will like, just push him <laughs> and clean him. Or he himself takes the decision to say, I'm going to plunge in. Now, here's the thing. The throne of grace is a water. Hallelujah. It's not always you will have somebody that will take you to the throne of grace. But if you think that I am too unclean to get in the throne of grace, you will remain more unclean. And here's the problem. The more the sun hits on your uncleanness, on your dirt, the more it sticks on your... Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? So the longer you stay outside of that throne of grace, even the dirtier you, and the stronger the dirt it will be on your, on your body. So you have a decision. I'm going to take a bold step with my dirt, enter into that throne, and call for cleanness and call for anointing because the throne is set for you to come in. I, I, oh, let me say it again. The holy of the holies were not set for everybody to go in. Hallelujah. But the throne of grace is set for anyone to go in. 
So when you look at the temple, the one who was in the outer court, he already knew that over there he cannot go. So he may not go. But the throne of grace is set so that anyone can enter and go. You are set free for divine purpose. Shall we take the book of John chapter 8 and we're going to read from verse 1. John chapter 8, starting from verse 1. Jesus went onto the Mount of Olives. Hallelujah. We already explained this last Sunday, I mean two Sundays ago, that before you go anywhere, you need anointing, which olives here represent the oil. The oil represents the anointing. Hallelujah. Continue. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. Mm -hmm. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. Hallelujah. Amen. Notice something. Where did they bring the woman in? Huh? No, no. Where did they bring him in? Which place? In which place? In the temple. Who was in the temple? Put it this way. That same temple without the Lord Jesus was called a, a, a place of judgment. That same temple, when the Lord stood in, it became a place of grace. Hallelujah. The place where they brought her to judge her in order to kill her, turned around to become a day of life. See how God works miracle. You may have feelings or you may have thoughts that those things are coming against you. They brought her in order to give her a sentence. But that sentence turned out to be grace. Where Christ is found, grace is found. Grace is always found. Because grace and truth did come through the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue, please. And when they had set her in the midst. And when they have set her in the midst. They say unto him. Mm -hmm. Master, this woman was taken in adultery mm -hmm. in the very act. Verse 5. They, this they say, oh, verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus took down and with his finger wrote on wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Hallelujah. Amen. He said unto them, the first who never did anything wrong, not even a penny of the thing, let it stop first. I mean, uh, throw it first. The throne of grace does not mean that you are not guilty of your sins. The throne of grace only means that the guilt of your sins is washed away by the blood. And because it is washed away by the blood, you can therefore enter there to claim anointing, to claim grace, so that you can fulfill your divine purpose. God is expecting you to fulfill your divine purpose. Say, Lord God, you are expecting of me to fulfill your divine purpose. Anoint me. You are expected by the Lord to fulfill your divine purpose. In order to fulfill your divine purpose, you must put on a coat that is different from all other coats. You must put on something that separates you, that sets you apart, that makes you different. In order to be separated and be different, you must enter in a place where you can get wet. Not on only any, any type of wet, but get in wet of something specific, different. They brought her. They brought her to accuse her. The place that was 
to become a place, the place of a judgment, has turned into a place of grace. I have watched a few videos where they brought somebody who was guilty of something. And when he arrived, they asked him, why did you steal this or did that? And the judge was asking him. And the person explained why he stole and why this happened. And the judge believed him. And he said um, to the, the one who prosecute, to the prosecutor, he asked him, what will be the, the highest penalty sentence? that the, the state will demand for this case. The state demanded that he stands, uh, spend 18 months in prison. And the judge told him, uh, the state is against you eventually, and the state wants 18 months of prison for you. But what I'm going to do is that I will send you in rehabilitation for 18 months. You see, if you get it right, you realize that the judge is telling to that person, we're going to give you not only another opportunity, but we're going to make you to reinsert life, but this time with something valuable. Because a rehabilitation center is a place where people go to learn a skill. You see what I'm saying? It's a place where they go to learn a skill. So whatever that was the problem as they went into court or uh, they were arrested, then we go to learn the skill so that when they come out into the, the day-to-day life, that we have now something that they will be able to do in order to stop what they were doing wrong. So by the judge giving him the opportunity to be rehabilit- rehabilitated, it's both to give him a new skill and to insert him to be productive for everybody else. Let's say it again. For the judge to give him the opportunity to be rehabilitated is to give him a new skill and to cause him to become productive and purposeful for everybody else. Because when that person who has learned, let's say, of becoming a plumber goes now into the world, I mean, into uh, uh, day-to-day life, the community, that person will now solve people people problems. So he has a skill for himself, and he has a value for the community. So Christ says, the same way I have set you free is that you yourself become skillful in me and valuable for the world. So what is the thing that God has given you for which you are to utilize in order to impact the world in which he sent you in? So that you fulfill divine purpose. Hallelujah. He sets you free for divine purpose. And Christ is expecting of you and I to be witness. Whatever the position we're at, he's expecting of us to be witness. Listen, when you have a relationship with somebody that you love very greatly, you can't talk about the person all the day, all the time, every time. If you have acquaintance with somebody, you forget about the person. When a person appears, ah, hey, my friend, yeah, how are you doing? <laughs> but if you have a relationship with somebody that is so close, when you go out, you literally think about buying like a, 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 a soup or a spoon for the person. But if you have just acquaintance, it won't happen. So the relationship that we have with Christ ought to make us want to share him. It is not possible that a man would have found a, such a great treasure and would have kept for himself, except he has a spirit of a thief. When the madman of Gandhara 
found the great treasure of deliverance, the first thing he wanted to do was what? To follow Jesus for what? For ministry. He said, Lord, let me go with you. The Lord said, I see what you have in your spirit. I don't take it away from you, but I say, even go among your own and preach it there. You know what I'm saying? The woman at the well, when she found the treasure, she said, I have found the one. The Lord says, he that you see, hallelujah, is the life, is the prophet you're talking about. She said, wow. She didn't even ask him permission. She just dropped everything. <laughs> Ran into the city, screaming everywhere. Because she knows she has found the answer that many were looking for, but they did not know where to find it. If in your spirit, you're not a person who share with others, you won't even be able to share the Lord Jesus. You won't. Because your constituent inside of you are not predisposed to tell about. But when you are transformed, this change, you may not talk about business, you may not talk about work, you may not talk about, I don't know, money. But about the Lord Jesus Christ is something that flows from your soul. And you don't even have to know the word for it. All you have to do is open your mouth. So you are set free for divine purpose. After time say, when we go, for instance, for evangelism, and we go... We cannot save somebody by telling him to repeat this, the prayer of salvation. But if we share with the person how the Lord saved us, this can convict him of also being saved. And when the person asks us, but what shall I do? You remember because the Bible said that when they were at the upper room and there were the people who came in the time of Pentecost, hallelujah, and they were listening to what was happening and has happened. The Bible said that being what? Prick in the heart. It ought to be something that goes in the heart of the hearer first. Before you tell him what he can do. But if you tell to the person, you know, which is sometimes what we do. Give your love to Christ. The, the guy does not even know what, which Christ you're talking about. <laughs> no, literally. He has no clue of that Christ you're talking about. That, that, you know, there are some people... There was a video I watched. A Muslim, he never heard about Jesus gave his life to Christ. Uh, uh. <laughs> he never heard that Jesus gave his life for him on the cross. He never heard about it. In 2023, can you imagine? In 2023, there were still human beings who had never heard that Jesus died on the cross for the sins. So you know and you have the impression that it is, everybody know. No. So if you tell to that person, for instance, who never knew that the Lord gave his life for him, and you tell him, give your life to Christ. Okay. That Christ that you're talking about is the one that he knows from the Quran. Are you feel what I'm saying? And that one, which, which, he won't get it. That's why the people were preaching Christ, what he did to now make sense in the heart of the person. So that the person in his heart has a desire to have that. So when we come, brother, sister, how are you doing? I want to share something with you. I was a thief. By the time you say I was a thief, the brother, uh, <laughs> if you were a thief, what means that you're not still a thief? <laughs> Hallelujah. I remember I went to Sam's club, literally. There was a lady who worked at Sam's Club. She was, I believe, the, one of the uh, supervisors. So I went in, and we started speaking, and the Lord started dropping in my spirit word of knowledge. So I, I started telling her what the Lord says 
from a very youth, about two, three years old, up to this day. And she was so convicted that, man, she knew that, yes, this God has spoken. And that was the spirit of God. And after, as I finished speaking with her, I told her, you see, your value is not found into what men or young men will tell you that you are. Your value is found into what Christ tells you that you are. And then I told her, if you go, in a, because people have been abusing her. But the reason why people have been abusing her is because she was in a place of abuse. That's what I'm saying. If you go in a club, nightclub, amen, what do you think you will find in a nightclub? Priest and Pope? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you go in a nightclub, you can expect to find whatever you will find there. Thief, robbers, pedophile, whatever you want to find that you will find that there. It is intended to be a place of sin. So if you go in a nightclub and then and you have put yourself in all those attire that are appealing to the men, do you think the man that is over there that does not have the mind of Christ, do you think that he will pray for you? <laughs> so I told her, that if yourself, you put yourself in a position, you dress yourself in a position that can make people uh, uh, like the, who are not Christ, you, you will find yourself being abused. And then I went further and I said, because you are a woman, you have to have on your body attire because a, a woman is made in a way that is attracting the opposite sex. So you have to have in your body attire which are decent, noble, proper. And I told her, you see, I, I said, if I ask you to come to my home and I take you in my bedroom and I say, I will pray for you, by the way you are attired like this, before I pray for you, I will make you two children. And I tried to explain to her that a pastor, a prophet, an evangelist, a, a, a apostle is just nothing else but a human being who's also exposed to the same thing. If you give him an opportunity, you can fall into it. But now, I was trying to explain to her why she should not be depraved after what God said. One week after I came to Sam's Club, I was coming, she saw me here. She wanted to see. <laughs> I said that she thought, oh, this guy. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I thought to myself, okay, that's a, that's a lesson. My point is, as you are, Speaking with people, being now in the divine purpose of sharing Christ, you have to share Christ as a solution that saves, that did die, and that truly did something valuable in order to shift something. If not, I can tell you, many people do have in their mind a Jesus that has nothing to do with the Jesus of the Bible. Hallelujah. And there's people who have no idea of what you're talking about concerning that Christ. They might accept a Christ that has, again, nothing to do with the word of God. You and I, we have been set free, delivered for divine purpose. And that divine purpose is to be useful, one, and first, to be a witness unto him. To be a witness unto him. In this world, they say, don't mind your brother problem. But they are always minding the, the problem of people. Yes, because, you know, in the community, if there is something going on, the neighbors, they will open the, 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 the blind like this <laughs> to see what's going on. When they hear one, 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 they will not stay in the room. They will come out to look to see what's going on. They're minding, hallelujah, the issue of the person. So as Christians, we ought to mind the life of another. We ought to mind the life of another. There is a lady, her name is uh, Yvonne. She's at some club. She always loves sharing about Christ. And she has always that smile 
of sharing about Christ. The first time I came there, I mean, the first time I saw her when I went there, I was going out at the door, and then she was so radiant, and then sharing about Christ. And one or two years after, she see the same. You see what I'm saying? She, she, she's not like the kind she did it today and tomorrow is over. No, she, she's still the same. And now they told her from her company that, first and foremost, they told her that she was, uh, uh, she was voted the best employee of the year because of her heart going, a joy of Christ. But some people do not like it. So they can't even, they, they, uh, what was that? conspired so that they should be, Quiet. So now they told her to no longer share a faith. So I, one time I went there and then she said, my brother pray for me because they don't want me to share Jesus Christ. I will. And I looked at her. She said, I will. And as people were coming to check out, I was standing with her and she said, you know the Lord Jesus loves you. Yeah, like, 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 hear it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She has that passion for the Lord. Now you, as a child of God, who has been set free and given the opportunity and the privilege, what is the passion that you have for Christ? And how do you express that passion? Now, you may not be shouting, screaming like the other one, hallelujah, but how do you express it? In any way you ought to express it. Because, again, we have been set free for divine purpose. Let's go back to the word, please. John chapter 8, verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Verse 8. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And, and, they, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own con conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Had, had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go, and sin no more. Amen. So the Lord Jesus looked at her with a different eye set. He looked at us and looks at us with a different eye set. Your failure are not intended to make you die. Let me repeat again. When you fail, it means that you did not put the gear correctly. You feel what I'm saying? Any machinery that you build... If the machinery fails, the intention of the machine is to produce something or to be useful on something. So if the machine fails, what you do, you open it, you look which part failed, and you fix it. Amen? So you improve at, at, on what we call your processes or your design. Because your attention is not to make a machine that you will trash. Is to make a machine that will be um, with, uh, what is that? useful. So the Lord made you as a useful child, servant. He says, for some he did as a, uh, a vase of honor, and some as vase of dishonor. Who is willing to be a vase of dishonor? No, no, you. You are not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because those that he made as a vase of dishonor, the Bible says that they have inside of them and they became like the child of the enemy. So if God puts you as a vase, even if you don't have honor, you can work towards that honor. Are you know what I'm saying? 
you can work towards that honor. And then have from him change and shift your identity. So as a child of God, because now you have entered into the throne of grace, and then you have boldly received, and you have been now anointed, you have become a vase of honor. And because you became a vase of honor, you only have to honor your Lord. And to honor your Lord, you have to be useful for the purpose of your Lord. So if you do mistake, your mistake tells you that there was something inside that you needed to fix so you can continually be useful. Hallelujah. So as a child of God, your failure are not intended to make you get out. Hallelujah. Every failure that ever happened are intended to show you there is a something that needs to be adjusted or fixed. Let's go back to the word. Read from me from verse 7 again. John chapter 8 verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Hallelujah. Amen. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Even though he did not literally say go and be an eyewitness, but I can affirm that the go is an action of the go to do something. So if you don't sin, then you live righteous, right? And in the righteousness of God, or of Christ, is part of also being a witness of him. Hallelujah. So get out from the place of condemnation, get out from the place of limitation, and go into the place of fulfillment. Hallelujah. If you don't go, because the word is go. Somebody say go. The word is go. So pay attention in the word of Christ. He's giving her an order that is at the same time an ability. Because whatever command God gives unto somebody is also provided with the ability inside the person. When somebody, when God say prophesy, he already gives you the ability. Because whatever does not exist when he speaks, that exists. So when God says, do, you're thinking I'm not able. No. Before he says, do, he sent in the ability and the command. So that the, his word don't fall on the ground. So the go is he's giving you the ability for it. There is no command out of God that comes out without the source of the ability to enable you to fulfill that command. There is none. That's why it says, let there be light. There is no light. There is a command. But the ability of the particles created light. He put that inside. So it become. So every word that the Lord has spoken over your life is not for you to figure out how to. It is for him to give you the ability out to. When you have that knowledge, you are less fearful. Hallelujah. How shall I? How shall I? How what I? Like a Gideon. When he told him, get up, go, fight. He already made out of him a mighty man of. Hallelujah. So before he told him something, he already qualified him being that thing. 
Even if Gideon took time to realize what was that, thank God at the end of the day, he did it anyway. But I will tell you, don't take time to fulfill what God said when you have the understanding of what he's saying. Because in what he's saying is, my son, my daughter, you have not called me, I have called you first. Hey. Hey. You did not call me first. I called you first. You did not chose me first. I chose you first. You did not love me first. I loved you first. This changed everything. Before, you see, before we saw the Lord, he sought us. He thought of us. Because which among us sent a letter to God to come on earth? <laughs> Amen. He was with his own counsel. And decided to say, okay, I'm going to send out this person out. And it pleased him to decide to make you and send you out. So he thought of you before you came in the earth. Hallelujah. So he gives you the ability to be a witness. He gives you the ability to enter his throne of grace with boldness. He gives you the ability to call for the anointing. He gives you the ability to operate in the anointing. See, yesterday, there's a lady. She called me. She said, uh, uh, she, she, she wanted to work with some of our products. And I told her, okay, we're going to design something for you and then figure out what we can do in order to put on your door. She has a gym center. So before the product arrives, there is a mechanism. I went there just to adjust to, to do what we call inspection. So I took out the door lock mechanism she currently have on her storefront, and then I put it back. The next day, she calls me to say, ah, the thing is uh, uh, stuck. It has not opened anymore. I said, Jesus, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> so I, re I, I saw the, the message about like two or whatever in the morning. And I sent her a message. I said, she, she wanted me to go Monday to see if I can help her fix it. I said, no, I ain't going to come Monday. I'm coming now. So early in the morning Saturday, I was waiting. Finally, I went there around 10 or whatever, something. So as I was going, listen carefully. As I was going, I did not know which part did I touch that caused this door not to open. Because the way I finish, when I finish, I did the test. It was locking and unlocking perfectly. But here's the problem. After you pass through that place, there is problem. Even if you want to explain it, it can only be one person. You. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Even if it happened that the, the system just failed right at the time you arrived there, it's you. Period. So I went, as I was going, I literally prayed and I said, Lord, give me the anointing to solve this problem. I did not pray expecting that I will do. I pray knowing that I have received to solve. So I arrived there like ready prepared. So I enter and I explain and she tells me, ah, it doesn't open. So I go. From inside, I try to open it stiff. It does not budge at all. Stiff. So I, I say, okay. I take the key, I go all the way out, and I try now to the front with the key, nothing move. But I already prayed that the Lord will give me the anointing to solve the problem. So I came back in, and I literally let the Spirit of the Lord lead me. First led, he got me to get my uh, plier. I got my plier. I put on, I tried to twist. You have only two options. Twist, break it. 
<laughs> because when you twist, you don't know what you're doing. What is the mechanism inside? At which part of the system the system is at? You don't know because you're not looking into it. But he, he led me to take the plier and to twist. And to twist with a little pound of force. So I did once, I re came back, I did two, I came back, and I did three, boom, it was open. It was like Gideon. Jesus. <laughs> and then, my, meanwhile, I talked to the lady. I prepared her to say, hey, listen, um, do you have to, something to do? She said, yeah, she has to go to pick up uh, something, something after 12, something. And I said, okay, uh, worst case scenario, you're going to give me the key and I'm going to figure out I won't leave this place until I solve the problem. And then when I solve it, I will come to give you the key. Or you can sit down here and then wait. Because I have prepared myself to get this done, whatever it takes. And I can go for, <laughs> I can go for hours. I will just get it done. But with the anointing, it was different. I expect it to be a long trail. It was unlocked. And now, the Lord gets me to take apart the system. And I look on the system. I had no clue what was that. But as I knew that I prayed, I asked the Lord to show me. And suddenly, he started drawing in my sight as a vision how this works, as this is supposed to be. And then and I understood the system right there. And I was like, wow, I should have taken a video to put on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember one time I was fixing a car. And our car. And as I was fixing it, the bulb dropped. And when the bulb dropped, I, I looked throughout the entire car. I could not find that, that bulb. The, the, the bulb light. I took five hours. I even put apart the engine of the car to find that, that bulb that dropped. Five hours. I couldn't find it. Finally, when I took up everything out of the car, I take the torch because when, when you hear some, something dropping this way, can you expect it to go this way? Ah, if you have something that dropped this way and you have a hole over here, where can you expect it? In the hole. So the thing dropped in the hole, but you not go through the hole. So I took apart everything that is around the hole. I searched for it. I searched for it. By that day, I did not pray for anointing. Hallelujah. That day, I spent five hours of mine. <laughs> I toil. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, at the end of the day, you are called to do what God wants you to do differently, efficiently, with boldness and anointing. Because when He tells you go, He gives you that ability to go. When He tells you do, it gives you that ability to do. So now the question should no longer be, how am I going to do it? Because the how is found in the command of God. Go, do it. Hallelujah. Today I would like to to share a couple of things added to this word. The decision that you make, remember, that we affect your future, right? Every decision. Any, any of them that you make will affect your future. But it will also affect the future of your children, children. What I want to share with you today is this. Before you do something, ask yourself, how will that thing be beneficial 
for my children, children. Hallelujah. The Bible said that a, a, a righteous man does what? And a righteous man keeps and leaves an inheritance for his children, children. The righteous man is somebody who does something right today. And because he did it right, then that right thing that he did lasted in time. So at the time he was doing that right thing, he did not see his children, children. But making the right thing in the righteous way calls him to leave something for his children, children. So the decision that we make today, now, is to ask yourself, will I, what I do now and today, how will it affect my children, children? First question you want to ask yourself. Second question you want to ask yourself, am I doing it under the anointing of the Lord or under my understanding? Hallelujah. Because things that you will do in your understanding will not always come out greater. But there are many thoughts in the heart of a man. But the, hallelujah. And they all lead to death. But the plans and the counsel of the Lord shall, amen, shall stand. Put it this way. If you know the counsel of the Lord and you apply it, therefore you are at peace with future. If you don't know the counsel of the Lord and you do how you think right, well, guess what? You will have to trouble yourself through the future. So the first thing I wanted to add on the word today is whatever you do, from now on, ask yourself, am I doing it out of my understanding or out of the anointing of the Lord? The difference is when you are anointed for the matter, you solve the matter for time to come. You feel what I'm saying? That matter is suffered today for the generation to generation. Hallelujah. Take the example of who? Joseph. Amen. He was anointed to solve the matter for generation to generation. Hallelujah. But on the other side also, uh, Abraham, even though he was not anointed for that, but Abraham caused a problem that lasted generation to generation. So, from now on, as a appointed, anointed of God, Ask yourself all time, whatever I do now, is that what I'm doing by my understanding? When, when I say my understanding, it means the learning that you have had from the world. The books, the textbooks, that's, that's our understanding. And remember, the Bible says that the wisdom of men is what? Foolishness for God. So it means all the things that you have gathered as an understanding is still foolishness. But they only become valuable when they are done through the wisdom and the anointing of God. Hallelujah. So the things you want to ask yourself from today on, what am I doing now? What am I able to do now? What I want to do now? What I want to invest? Whatever that is. Is that I'm doing it? Through my understanding or through the anointing of God. When you have that question answered, don't stop what you're doing. The second is don't stop what you're doing. When you know that the, the beginning of it was fulfilled and assigned by the will of God, please don't stop it. If you know it was not assigned by the will of God, please don't continue it. Hallelujah. But when you know it is assigned by the will, it is inside the plans of God, the purpose of God, don't stop it. Reward does not come because you only expect it. Reward also comes because you diligently do the right thing. Hallelujah. 
only expecting a reward will not bring you a reward. But diligently doing what is right will bring you the reward. For God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So remember those two. One, you are set free, put aside, delivered for divine purpose. And your divine purpose is to be an eye witness or a witness of Christ. And two, being a witness of Christ, he tells you go. In that go, there is a command. The first command is for you to perform. There is, there is an action. There is an activity. Hallelujah. You cannot expect to arrive while you sit down. Mm, how do you do that? Hallelujah. It tells you go. So that command embolden an activity, a functionality, a movement. But you have to make sure that it is him who said go. And function under his anointing. And if you are doubtful of whether or not you have anointing, it's not complicated. You don't have to do today a lot of big, 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 hallelujah. All you got to do, the Bible says, ask for it. Enter into the boldness, uh, the, 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 in the throne of grace with boldness. He said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. Hallelujah. And it shall be given unto him. Amen. Eventually, only let him ask without wavering. So, today, you go out. Two things. You are set free. Delivered for divine purpose. That divine purpose is to be a witness of Christ. And in that divine purpose, being a witness of Christ, you are to fulfill everything that you do by the anointing of Christ. You got to be on the mountain olives so you can fulfill whatever things that the Lord is assigning into you, into the temple, among the people. 